Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. Over the course of this semester, we've looked at several model systems. We started with the particle in a box, then moved on to the particle in a well. After that, we looked at the rigid rotor and the harmonic oscillator. Those models were all great ways to help us think about the basic principles of quantum mechanics and see how they affect the real behaviors of chemical systems. But all those models had one thing in common. They were all idealized situations. For example, in reality, there's no such thing as an infinitely high potential energy, like the one in the particle in a box. And the potential energy in a real vibrating molecule isn't shaped like a parabola as in the harmonic oscillator model. Today, for the first time, we'll look at a completely real system, something that's not an idealized model at all, but something we can actually study in detail in a lab. The system we'll talk about today, and in the next video, is the hydrogen atom. Eventually, we'll want to use the ideas of quantum mechanics to find its energy and write its wave function. But before we can do that, we need to think a little about how to describe a hydrogen atom mathematically. We'll start by imagining the electron in the hydrogen atom. For now, we'll imagine that it's a solid particle, but we'll take the wave-like behavior of electrons into account soon. So suppose we have an electron in a hydrogen atom. As you know, the electron can't move in every direction in the atom equally easily. That's because there's a proton in the nucleus of the atom, and that proton creates a potential field that the electron moves through. That potential field is very simple, but it's also very important for our understanding of the wave function of the atom. Basically, the potential field has two important properties. First, it's spherically symmetric. In other words, at a particular distance from the nucleus, the potential is the same no matter what direction we go from the nucleus. And second, the potential field is stronger the closer we are to the nucleus. Those two properties are pretty simple, but together with the basic principles of quantum mechanics, they're all we need in order to develop a very detailed picture of the wave function of the atom. The potential created by the nucleus is a very common one you'll see in many situations in physics, and is called a Coulombic potential, after the French physicist Charles Augustin de Coulomb, who discovered the way an electric potential between charged particles changes with distance in 1785. Anyway, the potential energy generated by the Coulombic potential in a hydrogen atom is given by this equation. Here, E is the charge on a proton epsilon naught is a constant called the vacuum permittivity, and r is the distance between the proton and the electron. The value of epsilon naught can be found in any physics text and inside the back cover of our textbook, and the same is true for the charge on the proton. So, why do you need to know that potential energy equation? Well, you might remember that in quantum mechanics, the equation we use to determine the energy of a system is the Schrodinger equation, which is this in Cartesian coordinates. You might also recall that the second term here is for the potential energy, and in the case of a hydrogen atom, the potential energy is given by the Coulomb potential equation we just saw. Plugging that into the Schrodinger equation gives us this. But wait. Back when we were looking at the rigid rotor model in video 11, we saw that the equations describing the energy and wave function are very complicated for a spherical system like the hydrogen atom, if we use Cartesian coordinates. So instead, we should use spherical coordinates. If you've forgotten what spherical coordinates are and how they're related to Cartesian coordinates, you might want to check out video 10, where we looked at spherical coordinates in detail. Anyway, when we change the Schrodinger equation from Cartesian to spherical coordinates, here's what we get. This looks pretty horrible. It's definitely much more complicated than the equation we had in Cartesian coordinates. And it would be kind of a nightmare if we had to keep the equation in this form. But luckily, we can simplify it into a much easier expression. First, let's move e psi to the left side of the equation. 
Next, we'll get rid of the constant out in front by multiplying both sides by negative 2m r squared over h bar squared. Believe it or not, this is a much more manageable equation than the one we had a moment ago. Here's why. The equation has three variables in it, r, theta, and phi. But if you look carefully, you'll notice that the first and last terms contain only the variable r, whereas the second and third terms contain only the angles theta and phi. That's actually the key that will allow us to solve this equation. Here's why. Way back in video 6, we talked about the general equation for a wave, and we had a wave that was a function of two variables, x and t. We were able to solve that equation by making one huge assumption. We assumed that the function describing the wave could be rewritten as the product of two simpler functions. One was the function capital X, which only contains the variable X, and the other was the function capital T, which only depends on the variable T. If you've forgotten that discussion, you may want to go back and review that video because the ideas we talked about back then will be important again now. Anyway, just as we saw in that earlier video, we can assume that the wave function psi, which is the expression that describes our system, can be written as the product of two simpler expressions, one of which depends only on r, and the other of which depends on the angles theta and phi. We'll call those two simpler functions capital R for the part that depends on the variable r, and capital Y for the one that depends on the angles. Now let's put that expression into our equation wherever we have the wave function psi. Now let's simplify this. In the first term, we're taking the derivative with respect to r. But the function capital Y doesn't contain the variable r, so we can factor y out of the differential. In the same way, the derivatives in the second and third terms are taken with respect to theta or phi. So we can factor the function capital R out of those differentials. Finally, let's divide everything by the functions capital R times capital Y. When we do that, here's what we get. Let's rearrange this slightly so that the two terms containing the variable r are next to each other. So, why did we do that last step? Well, take a close look at what we got. In our final expression, the first two terms only contain the variable r and no angles, and the last two terms contain only angles and no r. That means we can split this equation into two pieces, one containing only r and one containing only angles, and solve each of those separately. Let's solve the angular part first. If we rearrange that part of the equation slightly, we get this, where beta is a constant. But wait, if you look carefully at this equation, you'll see that this equation is exactly the same as the Schrodinger equation we had for the rigid rotor model way back in video 11. That means that capital Y, which is the angular part of the overall wave function, is the same as the wave function we had for the rigid rotor. Back in video 11, we saw that the angular wave function can be written using this symbol, where L and M are two integers with L equal to an integer with a value of 0, 1, 2, or higher, and M is an integer between negative and positive L. The equations described by the angular wave functions are also called spherical harmonics, and they pop up in many different applications in physics. Here's what some of them look like. The top row is the spherical harmonic where L is 0. The second row has L equal to 1, and so on. You probably realize that these look very similar to the shapes of atomic orbitals. They're not quite the same, though, because remember, these functions don't include the variable r, which does make some important changes to the details of the function. 
For that reason, let's now look at the radial part of the wave function, which we called capital R. This wave function is actually rather difficult to solve. The solution is a rather complicated function, but it's actually a well-known function that appears in many different applications in physics. It's called an associated Laguerre polynomial, named for the French mathematician who first studied them, Edmund Laguerre. The important thing to know about them is that, like the spherical harmonics, the associated Laguerre polynomial depends on two integers, n and l. Here, n is a positive integer, and l is an integer between 0 and n minus 1. So, think about the two functions we've looked at. The radial wave function depends on n and l and the angular wave function depends on l and m, and the integer l is the same in both wave functions. Remember, the original wave function, psi, is made of the radial and angular wave functions multiplied together. So overall, the wave function depends on all three integers, n, l, and m. As you can probably guess, those three integers are the three quantum numbers you learned about when you first talked about atomic orbitals in your general chemistry course. We'll talk about that overall wave function in more detail in the next video. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit more about the radial wave function. We mentioned earlier that the potential energy in the hydrogen atom results from the Coulomb potential, and a Coulomb potential is spherically symmetric. That means the potential energy depends on r, but doesn't depend on the angles phi and theta. So that means we'll be able to figure out the energy for the hydrogen atom from the radial wave function without having to worry about the angular wave function. To get the energy, we solve the Schrodinger equation. And as we just said, we can just use the radial wave function instead of psi. That's actually a fairly lengthy calculation, so we'll just skip to the final result. The energy of the hydrogen atom is given by this equation. There are two important things to notice about this equation. First, although the radial wave function depends on the integers n and l, the energy depends only on n. The second thing to notice is that, except for n, Everything on the right side of this equation is a constant. E here is the charge on the proton, epsilon naught is the vacuum permittivity, and A0 is called the Bohr radius. You might recall from way back in video number one of this course that the Bohr radius is equal to 52.92 picometers. Back in that video, we saw that years before the development of quantum mechanics, the Swedish physicist Johannes Rydberg realized that the energy of a hydrogen atom is given by this equation, where Rh is called the Rydberg constant and has a value of 1.09678 times 10 to the seventh wave number. If you compare that equation to the one we just derived from the radial wave function, you can see that this collection of constants must be equal to the Rydberg constant. And if you actually plug in the values of the constants e, a sub zero, and epsilon sub zero, you'll find out that those constants do indeed combine to give the Rydberg constant. So, now we can see why the Rydberg formula that we saw all the way back in video one is true. And that's a good place for us to stop for today. When we talk again, we'll look closely at the overall wave function psi, which we get by combining the radial and angular wave functions. That'll be the first time we've looked at the wave function for a real system instead of an idealized model. And we'll find out that the wave function itself tells us some more interesting things about the system. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week.